And welcome back to Radio DMG. I am your host, Philip Wesley, and with me in the studio today are... Peter S. Beagle and Connor Cochran. Peter S. Beagle is the pub- the author of The Last Unicorn and various other works of fantasy, fiction, and hopefully, probably fiction. <laughs> Generally fiction. Generally with, fiction. With some nonfiction moments, mm. essays, and... Actually, Peter's yeah. a poet... A songwriter, a fantasy writer, a nonfiction writer, a screen and television writer, pretty much the whole gamut. There a, is that. A Renaissance man. <laughs> well, no, I know people I think of as Renaissance people, but considering that considering that I've been doing this for over fifty years, one way and another, that I raised children doing it. Okay. You know, I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> Good for me. <laughs> I think it takes it takes a true renaissance to have raised children while doing this. <laughs> well, I was a 24-year-old sudden father with three children. And there's a line of Samuel Johnson's that I'm always quoting such moments. Depend upon it, sir, when a man knows that he is to be hanged within a week, it concentrates his mind wonderfully. <laughs> I had to start thinking. Mm. Working. And working has um, got, set you about publishing how many novels and novelettes? Well, actually, the, the scorecard has is, is gotten a lot bigger in the last decade. It has that. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter's I... most famous novels are A Fine and Private Place and The Last Unicorn. But he also has novels like The Folk of the Air, The Innkeeper's Song, Tamsin, and upcoming, two new novels, I'm Afraid You've Got Dragons and Summer Long. Uh, Working with me in the last 10 years, I kind of kicked him in the butt and said, you should write more short fiction. People need to know you really exist still. And uh, although he wasn't really known for his short fiction, between nineteen, between his first story that he sold when he was 17 and 1996, he only actually published about four pieces of short fiction, mm. maybe five. And then in the late 90s, he published another six or seven. But since we started working together in 2002, he has actually written over 70 pieces of short fiction, short, short stories, novelettes, novellas. Mind you, during that time, thanks to Mr. Cochran, to whom I'm eternally mm-hmm. grateful, I have amassed a total of roughly seven hours and 25 minutes of sleep. Ooh, wow. <laughs> uh, well, that was only because you took 2003 off. True. <laughs> True. Well, it's a restful year. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, going into these, what, what, set, what set, you, set you forward starting on your first book? What was the... What, what, when did you get into your head to write this book? Well, I always wanted to write. I can't remember not wanting to write. Once it was really clear that being a great jazz guitarist or playing first base for the New York Yankees, both out. <laughs> so that left nothing to do but, but write. And as far as the first novel goes, nobody ever sees this, including the writer I was imitating, Robert Nathan, But my memory is that I loved a book of his called um, One More Spring, written before I was born. And I just wanted to write that, except he already had. (laughs) So I tried to write something like that, and it happened that I was 19 years old and working at a summer camp as a music counselor. And after the children were put to bed, and there were various bunks, there's really nothing to do in the evenings. And I had an empty room I could work in, and my little portable typewriter with a birthday present, and lots of paper. So I just started writing, and as I say, to my mind, I was imitating Robert Nathan the best way I knew how, but I got about three chapters done that summer in that empty room in the the camp, and when I went back to college, I kept on working, and I had a couple of very good writing teachers who were very helpful and very supportive, and a roommate who didn't mind you know, if I was typing at one in the morning. You can't really type quietly, even on a Hermes noiseless portable. But I gave it my best shot and really tried not to wake him. And by the end of that senior year, I had most of a first draft. And that, the rest of the rest of the summer, I worked on finishing the book. Hmm. And that would have been 1959. And it's been a part of your life since. Well, the, again, Robert Nathan warned me when I dedicated The Last Unicorn to him 
this is going to be the book people know who don't know that you ever wrote anything else. Mm. But I find it, which is true, it's the way it's, it's worked out. And he lived long enough to remind me that he called it. <laughs> but the Fine and Private Place has always had its own cult. It was always my mother's favorite. It was what attracted Cotter's attention when he was 14. Uh, Peter had two books put in mass market paperback in 1969. One was A Fine and Private Place, and the other was The Last Unicorn. I read A Fine and Private Place first, was absolutely floored by it. I was 14 years old. I read The Last Unicorn about a month later and couldn't believe that the same writer had written two such very different but equally amazing books, and I've been a raging fan ever since. There was a, a book in the middle, which has never been published. I didn't think of myself consciously as a fantasy writer then. I just wanted to write Find a Private Place. Now I needed to do a mainstream novel um, mm. set, you know, in the hard and fast reality of our times. And I wrote, you know, a second novel about a young musician, not writer, wandering around in Paris as I was doing then. And it's like the old joke about the the curate's egg. It's very good in parts. <laughs> There's actually a fragment of it that's going to finally serve us and be part of a book we're doing. It's mm. kind of a romp through Peter's filing cabinet. Ah. A, a few years ago, Subterranean Press published a limited edition book called The, Le the Last Unicorn, The Lost Version, which was the first radically different, unfinished 85-page draft of The Last Unicorn, plus a new introduction and afterward. And we're taking that material and a lot of other stuff, the four chapters that were cut out of A Fine and Private Place by the publisher before the book was released, and, and many other little bits and pieces of, of uh, material from the filing cabinets to explore Peter's creative process and history. And one of the things in there will be a couple of sections of that unpublished mainstream novel from 1962. Mm. What was the name of that novel? What the hell was it? Um, he called it. He called it. It's a name we've stolen to use yes, later. That's it. Mm -hmm. uh, he called it the Mirror Kingdom, and oh. we've we've since actually used that as the uh, a version of that Mirror Kingdoms as the title of a best of anthology that was published by Subterranean mm. Press. Hmm. Going through like a a, um, a fine and private place and the last unicorn. I, um, going through a lot of earlier works from other writers and such, like Robert Heinlein or Philip K. Dick or um, H.P. Lovecraft, you see kind of a little bit of a politics into some of those. Do you feel that there is any kind of worldview or politics in A Fine and Private Place or The Last Unicorn? Is there a message you are trying to convey? Not consciously. There'll be moments when I'm making a point through a character or a character's making a point through me. I'm dread allegory, <laughs> symbolism. I always go back to Mark Twain's introduction, a few lines before Huckleberry Finn. A person is attempting to find a moral you know, in this story <laughs> will be banished. There's a couple of degrees, I can't remember the second one, but the third is a person's attempting to find a plot in it will be shot. <laughs> um, no, I Put it like this, um, years and years back I made the mistake of attending a seminar on my work. I'd never had one of those before. It was very academic, rather drowsy making, but a woman I liked and had known read a paper on my symbolism. and uh, She was on a novel of mine called The Folk of the Air. There's an old, old dumpy woman in there named Sia, Athanasia Sioris, Greek woman, who turns out to be an extremely ancient goddess. And she's called Sia for short, Athanasia. And, you know, my acquaintance pointed out that it was really clever of me to name such a person Athanasia, because apparently in Greek it means immortal beauty. And then I had to get up and say, Jane, I named her Athanasia because when I was in high school, I had a big crush on this Greek girl named Sia, Athanasia. Her father was named Athan, and hers was the feminized version. And it was the only name that came into my head when I was writing the book. All symbolism purely accidental. <laughs> Entirely. <laughs> accidental or occidental, right? <laughs> right. But def definitely, um, you know, like, like the disclaimer people put at the very beginning, of a book, any resemblance to 
any characters live, any people living, right, it's purely, living, purely dead, or undead, <laughs> right, purely, or undead, purely yes. coincidental, <laughs> and nobody, at least in my acquaintance, bases a character entirely on one person. I don't do that. I'll borrow a bit here, and a bit there. You have to start somewhere. You have to have a foothold. After the foothold, you're on your own. Mm. Um, any suggestions for our listeners um, on getting into writing? or the Sitting down is a very important part. True. I <laughs> mostly tell young writers, all I know is about showing up for work and making sure that what you do, you do regularly. You know, I point out it's a muscle like any other. The imagination is and the technique is. You go to the gym on a certain basis... You don't have to work all day the way I try to, but you do need to have a certain period of each day that's yours. It's your equivalent of Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own. <laughs> that's, that's the one where nobody bothers you, even if it's just for an hour or two hours. Those are yours. And even it's easy to sit there when the work's coming steadily and fluently. It's the really tricky part, the professional part, is sitting there when nothing's happening. Mm. and you still have to be there. I grew up with a family of artists. I had three uncles who were painters. And then we get to the the cellist and the choreographer, the art critic and so on, and the phrase I've used quite a lot recently is one that one of my Uncle Moses who used to say, if the muse is late, start without her. <laughs> My uncles would get up, have breakfast like anybody else, and go to their studios the way other people went to their offices. And they'd by and large work all day, except for two of them who were twins and very competitive. There'd be that break in the middle of the day where they'd sneak over to each other's studios just to see what the other one was doing that day. But that's what I grew up with, the notion that you can do this, make a life out of this, if you don't fool around, Mm. if you don't indulge yourself. And it was... I remember I had a, a fine and private place. I was working chapter by chapter. I had more outline than I usually do. And I'd play a game with myself. If I had a problem coming up in the next chapter, I wouldn't allow myself to go to sleep until I'd figured it out. I like to sleep. I'm very fond of <laughs> sleep. I'd figure it out. And uh, you've been losing sleep, though, for a lot for The Last Unicorn for quite some time. Um, there was that, you, you did a really great announcement this year at uh, Acon 22 about finally winning that legal battle that's been raging on for years. Well, now, winning is perhaps not the, the right term because there wasn't actually a court case or a oh. judgment. What happened was for seven and a half years we have been engaged in attempting to get the English company that owns the movie, The Last Unicorn, to actually live up to the contract and pay Peter what he's due. The, uh, just to give you numbers, in the last 11 years in America alone, two and a half million VHS tapes and DVDs were sold, and Peter received not penny one from any of them, except the ones we sold ourselves at conventions or on the website we set up to mm. help Peter. Uh, that's a pretty extreme case of ignoring a contract. And they had all kinds of standard Hollywood reasons for doing so. There, there, there was a claim that they hadn't made any money, and we'd knock that down, and then they'd claim something else, and we'd knock that claim down, and we'd be back around in the loop to the first claim. The claims contradicted each other constantly. It, 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 was, it was quite annoying. But, but finally, when we were just about to go to court, uh, we were actually able to leapfrog over this particular company and go to their parent company, which is ITV. It's a very, very large uh, European media conglomerate, about two billion pounds a year in business. It's kind of like saying ABC or CBS or NBC here in the States. It's a huge channel. Uh, Or Fox or Mm -hmm. The Uh, Guardian over there, that type of thing. Sky TV. It's it's huge. Mm. Um, They are actually the the single largest uh, source of original television programming in Europe. Big, big company. And we we went straight to their new CEO (coughs) with our legitimate complaint. And uh, we're fortunate enough to to run into uh, people who actually cared about proper treatment of creatives 
And they looked at the facts and came to the same conclusion that we came to. And it wasn't so much winning as finally getting the attention of people with the authority to say, yes, yes, this, this contract should be paid attention to, as opposed to a kind of standard middle management in a creative company where they're, they're just trying to save the company money and polish their own, own careers by doing so. These people deserve to be named. The CEO of ITV is Adam Crozier, and I have nothing but the greatest respect for Adam because he's the person who specifically tasked a man named Andrew Gerard with bringing this to a, a healthy for all parties conclusion. Andrew is the group legal director and corporate secretary of ITV, and when we met him for the first time last fall in New York City for our first negotiation, he and Peter hit it off like gangbusters. It turns out that Andrew is actually a reader. In fact, he proudly let us know that he'd read The Lord of the Rings 15 times by the time he was 17 years old. And of course, since Peter wrote the screenplay for the first film version of The Lord of the Rings, <coughs> they hit it off just immensely well. And, and in fact, of that two and a half hour meeting, I, I'll tell you that about half of it was just the two of them talking favorite authors with each other. Mm. And so we've had months of, of discussion, and we've, we've come to terms, it's all settled up now. Peter's getting paid what he's owed, and we're actually doing more than that. We're putting good business together working with ITV to see that The Last Unicorn is brought out in an even bigger, brighter fashion than it ever has been before. So uh, I wouldn't say so much that we won as everybody won. Uh, Fans, yes. and Peter, ITV, all across the board. Now, um, with The Lord of the Rings, was this the live action or the animated <coughs> Runcom... Oh, the, I'm sorry, the, the animated Ralph Bakshi one. The Ralph Bakshi one. Yeah, Ralph Bakshi. I, I did, what's on the screen mm -hmm. is mine and Tolkien's. I mm. share the credit with another writer, but I was brought in after he'd after he'd produced a script that I only remember for its misspellings. Ooh. <laughs> what was it like working with Ralph Bak Bakshi? Bakshi mm -hmm. is, in my estimation, a certain percentage of really talented man and fair, fair, fair sized percentage of street thug. I saw, I saw heavy traffic. <laughs> no, that's, that's perfectly real. And... <laughs> Um, the thing is, though, as opposed to Saul Zenz, who is comfortable and old shoe and scruffy, and you forget at your peril that he used to be a chess hustler mm. in New York. <laughs> Bakshi is what he is. He's out there, loud, vulgar, not to be trusted, but <laughs> it's right there. Yeah. And I must say that he's always wanted to be a real painter. And when he found out that my uncles were Raphael Moses and Isaac Sawyer. He turned into a nine-year-old hoping to meet Michael Jordan. <laughs> and the nicest I ever saw him was when I yielded to his genuine pleadings and brought him to my uncle Raphael's studio in New York. And I watched the two of them, actually towering over my tiny uncle, turning over um, Raphael's new oils, studying them together, and chattering happily in Russian. Hmm. Bakshi was you know, born in the Crimea and raised in partly in Palestine then and partly in Brooklyn. Hmm. But he kept his Russian. My uncles had gone out of their way, though they came to America at 14 or so, gone out of their way not to lose the language. And as I say, that was the nicest I ever saw Bakshi. For the rest, um, you learn <laughs> not to trust the man with anything important. But compared to Saul Zenz, I'll take Bakshi. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like adapting a, a work like J.R. Tolkien's um, The Lord of the Rings to a screenplay? And specifically an animation screenplay, yes. because the thing I've learned is that animation wants to be animated. It wants to move, it hates to sit still, and it hates backstory. <laughs> and The Lord of the Rings is all backstory. Really, it is. <laughs> Yes. With people explaining things to each other. And that is why the Lord of the Rings is probably still the longest animation film ever made. I'm not an expert, but I've betting it. And I remember I'm staying up in my little room at Claridge's Hotel, you know, 12, 1, 2 in the morning. God knows how many times I rewrote that script. And I remember telling Baxter, you know, we're. I'm three quarters of the way through the script. We haven't even touched the writers of Rohan yet. And Bakshi just groaned. And I realized, oh my God, he forgot about the writers of Rohan. <laughs> I used to think that 
The Lord of the Rings, at least, has to be the only book Ralph's ever read straight through. Mm. By the end of this, my work there, I wasn't entirely sure he'd finished it. <laughs> but I liked his wife very much, Liz, who's very calm and sane and knows exactly what she's married to. And I remember staying over at his house in Hancock Park in Los Angeles and meeting his children, who clearly adored their father. So what do I know about anything? Well, <laughs> you do know you do know your work and your and um, the La- the Last Unicorn and a lot of your other books like A Fine and Private Place, and you do have a do you have a, you have a bit of a um, you've had I think you've had an increase in following over the years, especially with the re-release of the uh, of the Last Unicorn and such. Um, since you are you guys are going to be putting out merchandise soon, um, eventually, what type of merchandise would you like to see for the Last Unicorn? That's Good God! Hard, yes, <laughs> everything. It's hard for me to think beyond lunchboxes. <laughs> no, it's it's something we've been looking into. Uh, you can go to uh, uh, Comic Con or Dragon Con or all these conventions and buy the strangest, most wonderful merchandise about the most obscure things, and yet you can't get anything based mm. on the last unicorn. So, Not even my little last unicorn. <laughs> right. Or perfume. Yes. The, the, oh, perfume. Well, that's new. That's um, new. That's new. The, and the reason for this is because the nature of the tangle of rights that was created by the original film contract, because it really did mess up and, div- and divide things in ways which made it unwieldy and, and gave incomplete pieces to lots of folks. Hmm. So we, for example, have would are able to do certain kinds of merchandising. Uh, recently, we've done a, an agreement with Black Phoenix Alchemy Lab to do a line of perfumes, 28 cents, based on last year. Born. 14 of them are out, seven more are about to come out, and, and they're quite wonderful. But they can't have the imagery from the film on them. They can't be marketed in connection with the film because of the way the rights prior to this settlement we're working on. You could always write it in French. No. <laughs> Le final unicorn. Uh, no, no, you, you can call it the last unicorn. That's oh, not okay. what I'm talking about. Mm. You can't use the visual imagery. Mm. We wound up actually having Rene Deliz, who did the graphic novel for IDW, the art for that, the pencils, do the pencils out of the label. But this is what I mean. You, you can't have a... We could go make a Last Unicorn figurine, but it couldn't look like the Last Unicorn in the movie. Meanwhile, ITV could go out and make those sorts of things, but they just didn't. We would People would come to us saying they wanted to make them, and we'd send them to the licensing department ITV, and they'd just bounce off and get no response. Mm-hmm. In fact, in, in all the years they've had the property, the only merchandising they ever did with it was one lunchbox deal and one, one T-shirt deal with Hot Topic for about a year and a half, mm-hmm. and some socks. I've seen some last unicorn socks that were generated in about a year back in 1999. But nothing else. Now, that's going to change. There's all kinds of wonderful things that fans like to have, and we're going to, one by one, start making certain they happen. Mm-hmm. Going back to books for a bit, um, are there any modern authors that you read? Mm-hmm. But not everybody knows them. Hmm. There is a writer who lives in Seattle about my age named Michael Gruber, G-R-U-B-E-R. I don't know what the hell to say about Gruber, as far as I can figure, his background is in um, marine biology. But I know he's worked in, I know he's worked in Washington D.C. Each of his books is different from the other, the way I try to keep mine separate. And I've never met the man, but I'll grab anything of his off the shelves. Um, it's hard to say whether he's a fantasy writer or I don't know, he's unclassifiable <laughs> but I just find myself whopper jawed, as Huck Finn would say damn I'd never have thought of that who the hell, it's like who the hell is this guy so Gruber fascinates me and I'm currently reading and being floored once again but a historical novelist named Diana Norman who was my email pen pal for some years and who died last winter. Hmm. And I've been collecting her work, which is hard to find in this country, and thinking all over again, damn it, you know, Diana, did you really not know how good you were? Her husband said she never really did. That happens with a lot of authors. It's kind of rare. They, it was kind of rare, even like, 
in today's today's age we have a lot of um the internet and all those all those types of social mediums where people find authors a little bit easier mm -hmm. it used to be that people would just wall um i guess waller i suppose in uh, obscurity for the majority of their lives which is why it's a good thing and a very fortunate thing that you are being recognized for your work and your contributions to literacy and to essentially culture. A writer named Harry Bernstein mm -hmm. who literally became famous at 96 died recently at 101 but he had written a memoir which suddenly became made him famous at 96 but he'd written fiction he was obsessed all his life with, with reading um, and I happened to have read the memoir I didn't know they had made him famous. I was delighted to hear it. As I say, he was 96. Again, luck has a lot to do with it. Patrick O'Brien, the is known for his novels about seagoing sea novels about the Napoleonic Wars. Mm. Patrick O'Brien has been around for quite a while. When the New York Times editor of the New York Times Book Review happened to need something to read on a transatlantic flight, read one of O'Brien's novels, wrote a two-page spread about his work in the book review, and all of a sudden, at a fairly advanced age, Patrick O'Brien was famous, which reminds me always of the line of the pitcher, Lefty Gomez, who pitched for the Yankees in the 1930s. He said, if they ever give you a choice between being lucky and being good, take lucky. <laughs> That's always a pretty good advice. <laughs> I think I've been very lucky. Mm -hmm. And you've had a pretty good public, public, um, publisher, too, to help you with some of this. Some of this cause I, I, I admit, I, um, I originally bought one of the first... Um, D when, I, when I saw the last Unicorn on DVD, I bought that first one. The one with the... Not the not, I bought the first one that came out. And then when I heard that you weren't getting paid for it, well, as soon as I was able to buy one where you would get paid for it i bought that one because frankly it's a great movie it's one of those that i grew up with um during the during the 80s i watched a lot of animation and during the early 90s lots of animation growing up in the 80s uh, mm -hmm. we'd watch animation um on saturdays i liked uh I liked a lot of the um uh, the fantasy ones like the chronicles of narnia mm -hmm. or um well, like uh, even some of the more bucolic books, like uh, Anne of Green Gables and such, yes. the live action stuff for yeah. that. But uh, um, books are, books are, are a big part of um, the fandom here at Acon and outside of this, um, like at Comic Con and such. A lot of them, um, you, you've got a lot of brand new fans. Is there a, a message that you'd like to tell them about? Your books, so like let's say for example, this is the first time they've heard of you. They they don't know um, no um, no uh, much of your work. They may have heard about the last unicorn from their friends or so. Um, would you rather they start with a fine and private place or with the last unicorn? I don't really care. I don't really care. <laughs> I know that the the movie for which mm -hmm. I'm very grateful has led a lot of people to the book. So that's usually the one people discover first. If they're interested, they find other books of mine. The way, hmm. if I fall in love with a writer, I'll try to jump on everything they've ever written. And the only message I have is that I do try to not to repeat myself. Mm -hmm. I get very nervous if I think, of, damn it, I used that before. Where the hell did I use that? I know I have. I, I can speak to that for a moment mm -hmm. because I'm the raging fanboy here. I've, I've been a fan of Peter's work since I was 14, like I said before. Um, I know lots of writers. Peter's now 72. I know lots of writers who are still writing well into their 70s and later, and some of them are writing really, really well. But they tend to be writing the, the thing they write. You know, it's the mystery novelist who's writing the 25th book about his famous, his or her famous character. And you buy that book because you love that character and that writer. And it's like buying chocolate ice cream again, because you just feel like having some more chocolate ice cream. Robert Parker comes to mind. <laughs> but Peter, because of this almost pathological fixation on not repeating himself, you can sort of start anywhere. You can find whatever story or novel appeals to you, 
and develop your relationship with that and then go try something else and and you're the only thing that you can be guaranteed is that it's going to be incredibly well written and that it's going to be deeply moving in some fashion uh i know again lots of people can scare the hell out of me lots of people make me laugh peter's one of the very few authors who can make me feel three or four conflicting emotions all in the same sentence and it's a real thrill as a reader to go through that kind of rich interplay of emotion. So um, my best advice to anybody is just start anywhere and keep reading and, and be ready for surprises because you, there is, for example, that Mirror Kingdoms collection. Jonathan Strahan selected 20 of Peter's best stories to put in what Peter called the Big Brick of Beagle <laughs> since it was such a thick book. And it, it's <clears throat> unlike most collections. You, you simply, if you were to take the names, the name Beagle off and just put the stories out there and ask someone, they'd tell you the 20 stories written by at least 10 or 12 different authors, mm. not by one man, because they're just so diverse. Uh, it's fun, though. There's a <laughs> French writer dead some years ago named Romain Gary, G-A-R-Y, whom I always, always loved reading. But part of my attraction to Gary was that he didn't hesitate to do something entirely different than the last time. If it bombed, well, it bombed. You try something else. But clearly he was keeping himself interested mm. as well. And people like that are the ones who catch my attention. Again, like Michael Gruber, I don't know who the hell you are, but okay, <laughs> I don't know anything about this book, can't make anything out of the jacket copy, but I'll read it. There's a question that I do like to ask a lot of the people I interview, especially at uh, at conventions like this. Now, at these conventions, there's a lot of energy that goes around. A lot of these, mm -hmm. a lot of these fans, they're very exuberant and outgoing, yes. when, and and um, very, 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 I guess, positive. And so, out inside the convention, but outside of it, they tend to clam up and be very shy, or withdrawn. A lot of them have actual trouble relating to people outside of conventions. Is there any advice you would give them to help them become more assertive or to uh, to bring that energy they have at the conventions to their everyday life? I grew up very shy. I was comfortable with a few close friends who were still close after you know, 65 years. And animals. I'm very good with animals. What I do, talking to total strangers who come up worshipfully, is something of a trick, but it's or learned behavior, <coughs> whatever you want to call it. But what I do know is that I learn to ask people about themselves because people want to talk about themselves. And it's only in conventions that a lot of them get to do it. And I suppose my advice is simply to, partly it's just plain practice, practice talking to people who aren't, who aren't you know, of your particular persuasion, so to speak, people who have never read Tolkien, whatever. But I know it, it, it it does take practice, but it's like the the outreach program for bullied gay, lesbian, um, transgender, <laughs> transgender <laughs> people, transsexuals. It does get better, and having done this so often, there's a great deal I can do in my sleep. I try not to do it in my sleep. <laughs> Sometimes it's a, it's good to be awake, especially if you have to write. <laughs> but I mean, I'm trying not to fall back on things I've said a thousand times. Mm. I try to talk to individuals. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes I'm tired and I'm not up to it, and it's just easier, easier to let experience speak for me. But you always find, always hit, especially at conventions, by things you simply couldn't have expected. Um whether it's people who will tell you that your work was the only safe place they had in a lifetime of childhood abuse. Mm. Or, or the ones who can't even approach you. You just stand there trembling at the edge of tears, and of course you have to go around and give them a hug and tell them it's all right. 
I never, <clears throat> never believed for a long time that my work had that effect on people. Now I accept it, but I can't ever take it for granted. Mm. And it keeps coming in very strange ways. Um, the classic example Connor and I both remember is of the two guys who I always say looked like the leg breakers that Big Julie from Red Hook sends over when you're falling a little behind on the vigorous, who saw my sign, caught the name, and came over to me, you know, with such rapidity and such vigor that I kept thinking, who do I owe what? (laughs) And it turned out that they literally grabbed my arm and said, your work saved our saved our lives. We are sane, functioning adults today because when our parents got into one of their ferocious um, divorce battles mm. where furniture and crockery gets broken and the police get called at some point, you know, we could run into the living room and close the door and put on the film of The Last Unicorn and just escape into that for a while. We have families of our own now, and we're actually sane. What the hell do you say to that? There's not much there. What possibly say? Yeah, there aren't many words to it that... There weren't. That would, I mean, words would seem superfluous at that point. And that's happened enough that, on the one hand, as I said, I don't take it for granted. But on the other hand, it's a responsibility in a sense. You have to be very careful not to not to say anything that that if you like that supports their vision of themselves which usually isn't very good mm. you you have to encourage them one way or another even if they'll never be writers or even if they'll only be you know internet writers or mm-hmm. doing fan fiction even so um, it's terribly important to to remind them that that there was a time when that was my only escape mm. into my parents' living room, which was wall to wall books. I used to say that I was I, weird, I was weird on the street, <laughs> and I knew it. Though the words nerd and geek weren't particularly around at the time, a geek was somebody who bit chickens' heads off in a carnival. Mm. <laughs> that was what the word meant. Mm. But the, I knew I was, in my family I belonged, which so many of them don't feel. I knew I was safe in my parents' living room among those books, none of which were forbidden to me. Mm. So I'm very conscious of the people I'm talking to, and hate to use the phrase, but I have some notion of where many of them are coming from. <laughs> And uh, it's it's good to never take your readers for granted, or time for that matter. Time's definitely not something to take take for granted. No, and I want to no. and I want to thank you for your time with us today. And um, like um, I, I I want to thank you for devoting this time and giving us this interview. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy enjoy your time at the convention. And I'm looking forward to the. Uh, to the merchandise and stuff next year and to what to what your plans are for the future which we're out of time right now so I won't ask you about that yet people well, just have to check up on people can find him he's got a Facebook page mm-hmm. Peter S. Beagle there's also a main Last Unicorn fan page on Facebook where we post all this information he does a wonderful newsletter called The Raven it's lots of fun and people ah, can sign mm-hmm. up and get it directly through the Conlon Press website and, I already uh, do <laughs> <laughs> and so if you already love Peter's work, come and find us. If you think you might love Peter's work, well, give it a try. Mm-hmm. There's more coming. Oh, definitely. Quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for your time today. My name is Philip Wesley. I've been your host this evening, and I'm here with... Peter S. Beagle. And Connor Cochran. And good night. <laughs>